Hello and welcome back to part 6 of this Antichrist series. In my last video of this series, we saw that Gog is indeed one and the same as the Antichrist. We saw by comparing the books of Ezekiel and Revelation that the timing of the Battle of Gog takes place just before the Battle of Armageddon breaks out on this evil age, when Christ returns in his glory. In this video, we will see how the nations that Gog uses in his final assault on Jerusalem are specifically mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. Having identified the Ezekiel 38 and 39 invasion as simply one more retelling of the many prophecies that speak of the Antichrist and his last day's assault against Israel, we must now turn to identifying which nations the passage says will be involved. As we will see, the great controversy surrounding this passage only increases with the discussion of what nations will participate in the coming Antichrist invasion. While a popular position interprets this passage as pointing to a Russian-led Islamic invasion, as we will see, a far more solid case can be made for a Turkish-led Islamic invasion. This Turkey versus Russia debate among Bible scholars is nothing new. As far back as the year 1706, Matthew Henry, in his classic Bible commentary, acknowledged the difference of opinion among scholars. He said, Some think they find them, Gog and Magog, afar off in Scythia, Tartary, and Russia. Others think they find them nearer the land of Israel and Syria and Asia the less, which is Turkey. The discussion and debate surrounding the efforts to identify the nations involved in Ezekiel's prophecy can also become extremely complex, but I don't believe it needs to be. The purpose of this video is to approach the debate in a fair, reasonable, and responsible manner as we identify the nations involved in this terrible last day's invasion of Israel and demonstrate how clearly Ezekiel's prophecy correlates and flows with the other prophecies in the Bible. It's important that before we begin, we clearly define our method to identify the nations of Ezekiel's prophecy. There are a few important factors that must be considered. There are two distinct methods commonly used by prophecy students to identify the meaning of the ancient peoples and places within various prophecies. The first method, which I agree with, is called the geographic correlation method. This method simply attempts to identify the location of the ancient people or place at the time of the prophet and matches that location to modern nations that now occupy that territory. The second method is called the ancestral migration method, which seeks to trace the descendants, their migrations, and their intermingling with other peoples, ultimately to a modern-day people. The first method, the geographic correlation method, emphasizes identifying the original historical context and understanding of the prophet. And the second method endeavors to accomplish the arduous task of tracing bloodlines into modern times. The ancestral migration method is fraught with difficulties, dangers, and inconsistencies and should be avoided altogether by all who seek to responsibly interpret biblical prophecy. When using the ancestral migration method, five different researchers can, and most often do, arrive at five different conclusions. Sadly, a survey of many efforts to interpret Ezekiel 38 and 39 reveals the common use of this ancestral migration method by many otherwise excellent scholars and teachers. For example, Wilhelm Jesenius, the revered Hebrew scholar, attempts to identify the Rosh people mentioned in Ezekiel 39 verse 1, not by determining where they lived specifically during Ezekiel's day, but rather where some of their descendants eventually dwelt over 1,600 years later. Consider Jesenius's definition of Rosh in his classical Hebrew and English lexicon. He says, Rosh is a northern nation mentioned along with Tubal and Meshech. They are Russians who are described by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century A.D., end quote. So for Jesenius, because Byzantine writers in the 10th century A.D. identified some alleged descendants of Rosh peoples as dwelling in modern-day Russia, we should thus understand Ezekiel's prophecy to refer to Russia. But as we will later see, modern scholarship has shown that Rosh peoples also lived in several different parts of the world, far removed from Russia. 
because ancestry and migration were one of Jacinius's primary standards for interpreting Ezekiel's prophecy, if he were alive today, he would have to significantly modify his position. This is simply one reason among many why this method should be entirely avoided. Ultimately, if Ezekiel's prophecy is to be properly understood, this deeply flawed yet widely utilized method must be rejected. Any responsible effort to understand Ezekiel's prophecy must use the geographic correlation method, which strives to discover the biblical author's original intended meaning and understanding of the text, not some historical wild goose chase that tries to establish blood ties to peoples who lived over 3,000 years ago. Another important factor that must guide our understanding and interpretation of these nations mentioned in Ezekiel are other clues found both within the context of the immediate prophecy itself. In our efforts to identify the nations of Ezekiel's chapters 38 and 39, our conclusions cannot be limited to historical research alone, but must also consider the larger context of the passage. Because God made it clear that the Gog invasion was spoken of by the former biblical prophets, if proponents of the popular Russian Gog theory cannot show a single verse in any of the previous prophets that speaks of a Russian-led invasion, then simply stated they have misinterpreted the passage. It is important that we not only attempt to identify the nations individually mentioned in Ezekiel the 38th and 39th chapters, but also the group of nations as a whole. Because the phrase is, Gog of Magog, the prince chief of Meshach and Tubal, identifying Magog as the region from where Gog the leader is from, requires us to identify the regions of Meshach and Tubal, for they are all obviously related. The wording of the phrase requires that it be interpreted as a whole and not merely according to each nation individually. So the purpose of this video is to identify the nations of Ezekiel's prophecy in a responsible manner, taking the original and the greater context of the passage into consideration. Within the first six verses of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, there are eight or nine ancient names given to identify Ezekiel's invading coalition. The leader of this invasion is obviously Gog. Let's read that in Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 6. It says, The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief ruler of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, This is what the Lord Yahweh says. Behold, I am against you, Gog, chief ruler of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you forth with all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them handling swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and his hordes, and Beth Togarmah, from the uttermost parts of the north, and all his hordes, many peoples, are with you. So the leader of the coalition is called Gog, who is from the land of Magog. The peoples or nations of his coalition are Meshech, Tubal, Persia, Cush, Put, Gomer, and Togarmah. Some scholars also believe that the word translated as chief should be translated as Rosh, referring to an ancient people. We will examine this debate later on in this video. Most students of prophecy today agree that Gog is from Magog and is the prince of Meshech and Tubal, though some would add Rosh to this list. So identifying Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and perhaps Rosh will do much to reveal from where the leader of this coalition will emerge. Let's begin by considering the location of Magog in Ezekiel's day. Numerous popular prophecy teachers today identify Magog with Russia or the former Soviet Central Asian nations, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. The primary support for this position is found in a comment made by the first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. What did Josephus say that has so swayed such a large segment of Christian prophecy teachers and scholars to accept this Russian idea? In discussing the various descendants of Japheth, Noah's son, Japheth is often listed as the last among Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Josephus says, Magog founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. But there are a few fatal problems with relying on Josephus to identify Ezekiel's Magog as Russia. First, as historian K. Christensen says, the Scythians were not a specific people, but rather a variety of peoples, referred to at a variety of times in history, and in several places, none of which was their original homeland. In other words, referring to Scythians as if they were all one people is simply historically inaccurate. All historians today acknowledge that Scythian was a catch-all term loosely used to refer to a vast group of tribal peoples, often related by similar cultures, but not genetically. Equating Magog to all so-called Scythian peoples, as dozens upon dozens of prophecy books continue to do, this is no different than saying that all Indians of early America were the same people. Any effort to connect Magog to all Scythians in an unqualified manner without identifying which specific tribe or tribes is to be flatly rejected. The second problem with Josephus' comments is that they were made in the first century. Ezekiel lived close to 700 years earlier than Josephus. In Josephus' identifications of the various descendants of Noah, he repeatedly speaks of those who are now called by the Greeks, thus and such. In other words, Josephus' comments tell us nothing about how Ezekiel would have understood the term Magog. For these reasons and others, as we will see, a wide majority of scholars today reject the Russian Magog position and place Magog instead in modern-day Turkey. Some scholars are so determined to prove that Magog is Russia that they even rely on evidence that doesn't exist. Numerous popular prophecy books and articles make the claim that the Russian Magog connection is supported by Philo of Alexandria. Philo lived from 20 BCE to 40 CE. He was a Hellenistic Jewish philosopher who lived in Alexandria in the Roman province of Egypt. Philo's deployment of allegory to harmonize Jewish scripture, mainly the Torah, with Greek philosophy was the first documented of its kind. But in all of Philo's works, he never once even mentions Gog. Like Josephus, Herodotus is also often quoted in support of the Russian Magog theory. But like Philo, Herodotus also never once mentions Magog. Herodotus was an ancient Greek writer, geographer, and historian who was born in the ancient Greek city Halicarnassus, part of the former Persian Empire, now Bodrum, Turkey. He lived from 484 BCE to 425 BCE. He is known for having written the histories, a detailed account of views regarding the Greco-Persian Wars. Herodotus was the first writer to do systematic investigation of historical events, so he is referred to as the father of history, a title conferred on him by the ancient Roman orator Cicero. In his writings, Herodotus only speaks at length about the Scythians, but even if the people who Herodotus knew as the Scythians were related to Magog, this still would not support the Russian Magog position. After citing three conflicting theories concerning the origins of the Scythians, Herodotus expresses his preferred belief not of a Russian origin, but Turkish. So Herodotus placed the homeland of the Scythians in Turkey and not Russia. According to Dr. Michael Kulikowski, a historian and professor at Pennsylvania State University, he said that the Scythians that Herodotus often referred to were to be found in a bit of modern Bulgaria and Romania and across the grasslands of Moldova and Ukraine, but not Russia. So although widely cited by those seeking to establish a Russian Magog connection, Herodotus provides no such evidence. Instead, he claims that the Scythians originated in Turkey and some ended up in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, but he never speaks of his Scythians as inhabiting Russia. Supporters of the Russian Magog position frequently cite Herodotus to bolster their case, but it is nothing more than an illusion. While practically every popular prophecy book about the book of Ezekiel places Magog in Russia, this position is almost never given serious credence in the more scholarly reference works. While some say it is not possible to know the location of Magog with any certainty, 
The overwhelming majority say that Magog likely refers to modern-day Turkey. Consider the following sampling of reference works and scholars who support the Turkish Magog position. As you do, ask yourself why this view is utterly ignored in virtually every popular prophecy book on the subject. Daniel I. Block, a scholar of the Old Testament in the New International Commentary on Ezekiel, says, It seems best to interpret Magog as a contraction of an original Matgugi, land of Gog, and to see here a reference to the territory of Lydia in western Anatolia, which is Turkey. The Zondervan Illustrated Bible Dictionary states, Magog, possibly meaning the land of Gog, was no doubt in Asia Minor, Turkey, and may refer to Lydia. Then we have the IVP Bible Background Commentary, lists Magog, Meshach, and Tubal, and Togarma as sections or peoples in Asia Minor, Turkey. The New Unger's Bible Dictionary, under the entry for Magog, states, It is clear that Lydia, Turkey, is meant, and that by Magog we must understand the land of Gog. The Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary places Magog in Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey. Catholic Encyclopedia says, It seems more probable that Magog should be identified with Lydia, Turkey. On the other hand, as Meshach and Tubal were nations belonging to Asia Minor, it would seem from the text of Ezekiel that Magog must be in that part of the world. Finally, others with Josephus identify Magog with Scythia, but in antiquity this name was used to designate vaguely any northern population. Then the Holman Bible Atlas places Magog in Turkey. The new Moody Atlas of the Bible also places Magog in Turkey as well as the Zondervan Atlas of the Bible and the IVP Atlas of Bible History. Now let's consider some of the historical sources that support this position. Maimonides, also known as Rambam, was a medieval Jewish philosopher who lived from 1138 to 1204 AD. He had considerable influence on Jewish thought and on philosophy in general. Maimonides also was an important codifier of Jewish law. His views and writings hold a prominent place in Jewish intellectual history. In his writings, the Hitchot Teramot, he identifies Magog as being in Syria on the border of Turkey. Pliny the Elder was a Roman military commander, an author, naturalist, and philosopher from the first century. Pliny spoke of a city called Bembis, otherwise called Aeropolis. Ancient Aeropolis sat on the border of modern-day Turkey and Syria. So according to Pliny, who wrote in the first century, Magog was a well-known city in the region of Turkey and Syria. Pliny's comments are easily as significant as Josephus's comments, yet where Josephus's comments have been cited dozens upon dozens of times to support the identification of Magog with Russia, but one will not find Pliny's comments cited anywhere. Pliny's view is also supported by Sir Walter Raleigh in his History of the World, where he says, Yet it is not to be denied that the Scythians in old times coming out of the northeast wasted the better part of Asia the less and possessed Cola Syria, which was a region of Syria, where they built both the Scythopolis and the Aeropolis, which the Syrians called Magog, and that to this Magog Ezekiel had reference, it is very plain. For this city, Aeropolis, or Magog, standeth due north from Judea, according to the words of Ezekiel, that from the north quarters those nations should come. End quote. Hippolytus of Rome, an early Christian theologian in his Chronicon, he wrote his book Chronicon in the year 234-235 A.D. Hippolytus rejected Josephus' identification of Magog with the Scythians, connecting them instead to the Galatians in Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. After all historical sources have been considered, and after considering the varied opinions of modern-day scholarship, the origins of Magog seem to have been on the border of Syria and Turkey. After planting the self-named city of Magog, also called Aeropolis, in Syria near the border of Turkey, some Magog peoples migrated to central and western Turkey and planted the kingdom of Lydia, which occupied the whole western half of Turkey and thrived during Ezekiel's day. 
As previously mentioned, Lydia was the kingdom whose king was known as Gugu by the Assyrians and Gyges by the Greeks, and who many biblical scholars identify with Ezekiel's Gog. Near to Ezekiel's day, some from Gog likely migrated north of the Black Sea to Moldova, the Ukraine, and Russia. These northern tribes could have been those who Josephus and Herodotus referred to as the Scythians. But while some from Magog likely dwelt north of the Black Sea during Ezekiel's day, many others from Magog also retained a strong presence in their historical homeland of Asia Minor, Turkey. As such, far more scholars today identify Magog as the region of Turkey rather than Russia. Ultimately, however, as we have said, determining how Ezekiel would have understood the term Magog will not be found in analyzing the singular term Magog, but rather in the full phrase Gog of Magog, the prince chief of Meshach and Tubal. Because Gog is from Magog and is prince over these other two peoples, it is important that we continue to study the location of these other people groups during Ezekiel's day in order to understand the phrase as a whole. In keeping with its Russian-centric interpretation of Ezekiel 38, the Schofield Study Bible identifies Meshach as the city of Moscow and Tubal as Tobolsk, a city in central Russia. This position was followed by numerous prophecy books for many years, but because of the complete lack of any historical support for this position, today it has been abandoned by virtually everyone. Following is a partial list of reference works that place both Meshach and Tubal in the region of modern-day Turkey. You see this list here, the Holman Bible Atlas, Oxford Bible Atlas, the IVP New Bible Atlas, the IVP Atlas of Bible History, New Moody Atlas of the Bible, Zondervan Atlas of the Bible, Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, the Macmillan Bible Atlas, and the Baker Bible Atlas. So all these various writings also point to modern-day Turkey. It is important to note that today nearly all scholars identify both Meshek and Tubal as relating to modern-day Turkey. As we have stated throughout our study, in order to properly identify Magog, the homeland of Gog, we must first identify both Meshek and Tubal. Because both of these peoples would have been understood by Ezekiel to refer to the region of modern Turkey, we can also deduce that Magog is also a reference to Turkey. Simply stated, if Magog refers to Russia, then the wording of the phrase simply doesn't make any sense. How could Gog, a leader from Russia, be referred to as the prince or leader of Turkey, Meshek and Tubal? It just doesn't make sense. If we simply follow the leaning of most scholars who place Magog in Turkey, then it makes complete sense, both grammatically and geographically, that Gog would be the prince of Meshach and Tubal, which are also in Turkey. As Daniel I. Block states, the order of Ezekiel's triad of names reflects an awareness of geographic and recent political realities in Anatolia. Gog, Lydia, situated farthest west, is at the head of an alliance with Meshach on her eastern border and Tubal east of Meshach, end quote. Beyond making sense of the passage grammatically and geographically, the Turkish Gog position also flows harmoniously with all of the other prophecies that we've previously examined. As was discussed at the beginning of this video, one of the primary factors that should determine our understanding of this passage is God's declaration to Gog that he and his hordes are the ones who have been repeatedly referenced in the previous prophetic scriptures. While this statement of God has been an insurmountable problem for those who seek to paint this passage as a Russian invasion, it only serves to establish the case for a Turkish-led Islamic invasion of Israel, whether we are speaking of the prophet Joel's invading army from the north, Zechariah's invasion of Israel, Daniel's desolating king of the north, or several other key end time texts. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is simply one more retelling of that which all the prophets have been speaking about. Before concluding our discussion, it is important that we identify the final five nations involved in the Gog invasion. Scholars, historians, and even most popular prophecy books generally all agree as to the identity of the next three nations. The first is Persia, which refers to modern-day Iran. 
ancient Kush, often translated as Ethiopia, is actually a reference to the region immediately south of Egypt, referring to northern Sudan. Put refers to Libya and could possibly include other portions of northern Africa. The last two nations, Gomer and Togarma, once again refer to modern-day Turkey. In the earlier part of the last century, it was common for prophecy teachers to tie Gomer to Germany, but today this view has been rejected by virtually all reputable Bible scholars and prophecy teachers. Virtually any Bible atlas that one consults will place both Gomer in Turkey and Togarma in eastern Turkey. Following is a partial list of Bible atlases that follow this identification. We have the Holman Bible Atlas, the Oxford Bible Atlas, the IVP Atlas of Bible History, New Bible Atlas, the Macmillan Bible Atlas, the Zondervan Atlas of the Bible, Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, New Moody Atlas of the Bible, and the Baker Bible Atlas. It is important to briefly discuss an argument frequently used by Russian Gog theorists concerning the phrase, the uttermost parts of the north, mentioned in Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, verses 14 through 15. You can see in verse 15, mentions the utter parts of the north. Because Gog is said to come from the uttermost parts of the north, many say that this can only mean Russia. But this argument is not thought through, for within the same passage, the very same Hebrew phrase is used of Togarma in Ezekiel 38, verse 6. And virtually all scholars agree that Togarma was located in eastern Turkey or in neighboring Armenia. As such, any argument that says there is no way that Turkey could be considered a nation located in the remotest parts of the north falls flat on its face. If Togarma in Turkey is referred to as being in the remote parts of the north, then there is absolutely no basis to use precisely the same phrase to argue for a Russian identification of Gog. In fact, because we know that the phrase remote parts of the north is used within the same passage to refer to Turkey, it would also only stand to reason that the same phrase applied to Gog would establish him as coming from Turkey as well. In conclusion, then, after having considered all the many arguments concerning the identity of Gog and his coalition, we can confidently say that the invading coalition of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 refers to the following nations. You can see this uh, list of nations here. Magog refers to Turkey. Rosh, if it is a nation, refers to Turkey. Meshach refers to Turkey. Tubal refers to Turkey, Persia refers to Iran, Kush refers to Sudan, Put to Libya, Gomer also to Turkey, and Togarma to Turkey and Armenia. Of course, this list is not exhaustive. The text specifically says that many other nations will be included in this invasion mentioned in Ezekiel 38, 5 through 6. The la- you can see here the last portion of verse 6 it says, Many peoples are with you. Is it possible then that Russia will participate in the last day's invasion of Israel? Well, it is possible, but nowhere is this ever expressly prophesied in the Bible. To discuss this possibility would be nothing more than speculation. As we have said from the beginning of this video, as students of the scriptures, our end times perspective should emphasize that which the scriptures emphasize, and where it is silent, we should remain silent or use extreme caution. Because this prophecy so clearly emphasizes Turkey as the head of the coming Antichrist invasion of Israel, it would seem quite reasonable that the students of the scriptures should watch Turkey very carefully. You can see on this map here where all those nations mentioned by Ezekiel are situated surrounding Israel. Now we come to perhaps one of the most controversial parts of Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Hebrew word Rosh. I think we need to deal with this word, so spend this last 10-15 minutes or so talking about it. The word Rosh is found in Ezekiel 38, verses 2 through 3, and and chapter 39, verse 1. Ezekiel 39, 1 says, You, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, This is what the Lord Yahweh says. Behold, I am against you, chief Gog, ruler of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around and will lead you on, 
and will cause you to come up from the uttermost parts of the north, and I will bring you on the mountains of Israel. Many advocates of a Roman Antichrist believe that Russia comes from this word Rosh, so it's important that we take a look at this. The Hebrew word Rosh means chief, as you can see here in the Strong's Concordance. The word Rishon, it means uh, chief, as you can see and down below there it says from Rosh. Some scholars want to translate the word Rosh as a proper noun or as a place in Ezekiel. As is often the case, Bibles translate this verse differently. For example, the Amplified Bible translates Rosh as an adjective with the word chief. As you can see here, the Amplified Bible, uh, Ezekiel 39.1, And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, thus says the Lord God. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince. So they, they translate that word Rosh as prince, as an adjective. However, the New King James Bible translates Rosh as a proper noun or a place. As you can see here, it says, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. As we will see in this discussion, whether the word Rosh means chief as an adjective or a place called Rosh as a proper noun, it still cannot apply to Russia. Four well-known Bible commentators have tried to apply the word Rosh to mean Russia. These four are Wilhelm Jesenius, Carl Friedrich Kyle, James Price, and Clyde Billington. But despite the many impressive points brought up by these scholars, when we consider the totality of their arguments, the case for seeing Ezekiel's prophecy as referring to Russia completely fails. Let's consider the arguments and where they fall short. Wilhelm Jesenius is by far the most referenced scholar in support of the Russian Rosh position. While Jesenius's grammatical arguments must be considered, Jesenius's effort to link Rosh to Russia relies almost entirely on the testimony of Byzantine and Arab writers who lived close to 1600 years after Ezekiel's day. Jesenius's clear reliance on the ancestral migration method is to be rejected by any scholar seeking to responsibly interpret the text through the historical grammatical method. The next scholar often looked to in support of the Russian Rosh position is Carl Frederick Kyle. But on grammatical grounds, Kyle is far less dogmatic than Jesenius, admitting that the translation of Rosh as a proper name is only probable. Interestingly, eight years after the release of Kyle's commentary on Ezekiel, Kyle's instructor in Hebrew, Ernest W. Hegstenberg, released his own commentary on Ezekiel and quite directly disagreed with Kyle. Mr. Hegstenberg says, Gog is prince over Magog, moreover chief prince, king of the kings over Meshach and Tubal, the Mashi and Tabarani, who had their own kings but appear here as vassals of Gog. Many expositors render, instead of chief prince, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. He goes on to say, But the poor Russians have been here very unjustly arranged among the enemies of God's people. Rosh, as the name of a people, does not occur in all of the Old Testament. End quote. On historical grounds, Kyle only follows Jesenius, also basing his larger arguments upon the testimony of those 10th century Byzantine and Arabic writers. The Byzantine and Arabic writers frequently mention a people called Rus, R-U-S, dwelling in the country of the Taurus and reckoned among the Scythian tribes. So also there is no reason to question the existence of a people named Rosh. Beyond this, concerning his identification of Rosh as Russia, Kyle's co-author, Frederick Delich, also disagreed, placing Magog not in Russia, but Turkey. Of course, in all the many prophecy books that take the Russian Rosh position, none ever reference either Delich or Hegstenberg. James Price is another authority frequently cited by those who take the Russian Rosh position. Price, a Hebrew scholar, in his article, Rosh, an ancient land known to Ezekiel. Like Jesenius and Kyle before him, argues in favor of interpreting Rosh as a place name. Again, Price's grammatical arguments must be considered. Price also argues that Rosh would have been known in Ezekiel's day, but that is all he argues. 
Nowhere does Price ever attempt to identify where the Rosh people lived in Ezekiel's day. In fact, throughout his article, he repeatedly cites other scholars who place Rosh peoples in lands other than Russia. At the very outset of his article, for example, cites J. Simmons, who places Rosh squarely in Asia Minor, Turkey. Citing James Simmons here, he says, that in one or more of these texts, a people of that name whose home was in Asia Minor, Turkey, is indeed mentioned, is not entirely disproved, end quote. Other sources cited by James Price place Rosh in either Iraq or Iran, but none in Russia. Clyde Billington is the fourth scholar frequently cited in support of the Russian Rosh position. Of the four, Billington is the only scholar who truly attempts to tackle the historical aspects of the argument. While Billington is clearly an ardent supporter of the popular Russian Rosh idea, he also admits that in Ezekiel's day, the Rosh peoples were a diverse and vast group of people who lived in nations as far and wide as modern-day Russia, Central Asia, India, Iraq, and Turkey. Mr. Billington says, it is likely that the Rosh people were a very large group of people located over a broad area north of the Caucasus Mountains. Some members of this group, the Rhys, moved south and conquered India in 1600 BC, where they formed the ruling class there. Other members of this group conquered and ruled northern Mesopotamia, the kingdom of Matani, for about 200 years from 1580 to 1350 BC. When the kingdom of Mitanni was destroyed by the Hittites in 1350 B.C., some Ross Resh Ross peoples joined the Philistines in attacking Israel. Some also moved into Turkey, which is where some probably joined the Philistines. The Egyptians called these allies of the Philistines Teresh. In other words, the Ross people were widely dispersed. End quote. Billington here even mentions some Rosh peoples during Ezekiel's day who lived in China. He says some Rosh peoples penetrated as far east as the borders of northeast China in 500 BC, where blondes were found buried in the permafrost. End quote. But there is another important factor that causes the identification of the Rosh peoples to extend far beyond even China and India. According to Billington and numerous others who have followed him in this point, the word Rosh is simply a variant of Tyrus. The Rosh name is probably derived from the name Tyrus in Genesis chapter 10 verse 2, where both Tyrus and Rosh and variations of these two names were used for centuries for the Rosh people. Yet during Ezekiel's day, Tyrus Rosh peoples lived in regions far removed from Russia. In Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, only a few lines beyond the well-cited comment regarding Magog and the Scythians, Josephus also says, Thyrus Tyrus called those whom he ruled over Thyratians, but the Greeks changed the name into Thracians. Thrace was located in modern-day Turkey, Bulgaria, and Greece. Tyrus is also said to have founded a colony called Miletus in western Turkey in the 6th century B.C., other historical evidence indicates that the descendants of Tyrus were the Etruscans of Asia Minor, who later came to occupy Italy. For this reason, both the Macmillan Bible Atlas and the Zondervan Atlas of the Bible place Tyrus in either Greece or Italy. Interestingly, the ancient Etruscans called themselves the Racena. Billington believes this is due to a clear connection to the Ras, Ross, Rosh peoples. In other words, number one, even if we do accept the translation of Rosh as a proper noun, and two, understand it to be a place name, in no way does this point solely to Russia. In fact, most scholarly works place Tyrus on the west coast of Turkey or the greater region of the Aegean Sea on the west coast of Turkey. Because various Rosh peoples lived in numerous locations during Ezekiel's day, any effort to identify Rosh solely with Russia while ignoring the other Rosh peoples of Turkey, Iraq, Italy, India, or China is simply not an honest approach. When teachers cherry-pick the historical data to support their prophetic positions, they do a great disservice to their students. 
Yet sadly, in considering a majority of the popular prophecy books today, this is precisely what many teachers do in their ongoing effort to point to Russia as the leader of Ezekiel's prophesied last day's invasion. When one reads only the popular prophecy books that support the Russian Rosh position, the authors will frequently use superlatives, creating the impression that no legitimate scholar would reject the translation of Rosh as a place name and its identification with Russia. Concerning the fact that Russia will head an alliance against Israel, all agree, says Schofield. But the picture that some of these authors paint can at times border on dishonesty. Consider the following sampling of other equally qualified scholars who do in fact disagree with the Russian Rosh position. For example, Daniel Block, a premier scholar of the Old Testament, argues that the popular identification of Rosh with Russia is impossibly anachronistic and based on a faulty etymology, the assonantal similarities between Rosh and Russia being purely coincidental. Ezekiel's point is that Gog is not just one of the many Anatolian, or from the area of Turkey, princely figures, but the leader over several tribal national groups. End quote. Charles Ryrie, in his Ryrie Study Bible, disagrees with the Russian Rosh interpretation and says that the Prince of Rosh should be translated as the Chief Prince. End quote. Dr. Merrill F. Unger admits that linguistic evidence for the equation Rosh as Russia is confessedly only presumptive. End quote. Another Bible scholar, Edwin Yamauchi, argues that the word Rosh can have nothing to do with modern Russia. This would be a gross anachronism, for the modern name is based upon the name Rus, which was brought back into the region from Kiev, north of the Black Sea, by the Vikings, only in the Middle Ages. Yamauchi goes on to claim that associating Ezekiel's Rosh with Russia to be groundless and having unfortunately gained widespread currency in the evangelical world through many different channels. End quote. Another scholar, A. R. Millard, endorses Yamauchi's claim when he says, Some commentators have tried to interpret the prophecies as applying literally to Russia. Although these views have spread widely and convinced many, Tamauchi shows why they are wrong and should be avoided by careful Bible students. End quote. Ralph Alexander in the Expositor's Bible Commentary on Ezekiel states of Rosh, says the accentual system and syntactical construction of the Hebrew language strongly indicate an apositional relationship between the words prince and chief. Both terms are related equally, then, to the two geographical words Meshach and Tubal. Grammatically, it would seem best to render the phrase the prince, the chief of Meshach and Tubal. End quote. A. B. Davidson, in his commentary, The Book of the Prophet Ezekiel, says, Of course, any connection between the name Rosh and Russia is to be rejected. End quote. J. W. Weavers, in the New Century Bible Commentary on Ezekiel, says, The word for head is misunderstood as a proper name, leading to a bizarre identification by the misinformed with Russia. End quote. Another commentator, Walter Zimarelli, in a commentary on the Bible book of Prophet Ezekiel, chapters 25 through 48, says, Certainly Rosh, chief, is to be connected with prince, and is not to be interpreted as a geographical indication, end quote. Then we have Charles Feinberg, author of the Prophecy of Ezekiel, says, The glory of the Lord states, There have been many writers who connected the name Rosh with the Russians, but this is not generally accepted today. D.R.W. Wood in the New Bible Dictionary says the popular identification of Rosh with Russia has nothing to commend it from the standpoint of hermeneutics. End quote. And lastly, John Bright, author of The Kingdom of God, said in Ezekiel 38 through 39 We have a prophecy which some quite wrongly believe will be fulfilled by present day Soviet Russia. So it should be obviously clear that despite the many statements to the contrary, numerous very well-qualified scholars reject the popular Russian Rosh position. Now let's revisit the first two elements of the Russian Rosh argument to assess if these two points hold up to scrutiny. 
As previously mentioned, the first two points are grammatical. One, the word ra should be translated as a noun and not an adjective. And two, as a noun, ra should be translated as the proper noun, rosh. Our brief review of the divisions among scholars on this issue shows that both sides raise legitimate points. One side argues that the construction of the phrase demands that Rosh is interpreted as a noun. The other side argues that Rosh as a name is nowhere used in scripture and that its relationship to the other words in the passage demand that it is translated in normal fashion simply meaning head or chief. For years, the two sides have been unable to resolve this conflict. But in more recent years, having the advantage of being able to consider all sides of this centuries-old debate, as well as the modern advances in scholarship, Daniel Block, a premier scholar of the Old Testament, has very ably offered a solution satisfying the issues raised by both sides. Block acknowledges the need to translate Rosh as a noun, but also acknowledges the need to translate it according to its normal usage throughout the Bible as a reference to chief, as well as its appositional relationship to the other names in the text. Bloch's translation reads as follows, Set your face toward Gog, the land of Magog, the prince chief of Meshach and Tubal. And so, of the first two grammatical arguments, we see that while the first point seems to be valid, Ra should be translated here as a noun, but not a proper noun. Do a Bible comparison on the Bible Hub or something similar and look up Ezekiel 38.3 or Ezekiel 39.1 and you will see that many Bible translations use the word chief instead of Rosh. But what about the two historical arguments necessary to prove the Russian Rosh position? Of these two, the first point that Rosh was a people well known to Ezekiel seems to have been proven fairly substantially by Billington and other historians. On the final point, however, namely that Rosh was most likely known by Ezekiel as a people from the region of modern Russia, Billington and all others fail to establish their case. Because of the wide range of Rosh peoples and all of their variants that were well known by the kings and peoples of the region in those days, Any effort to point solely to Russia is an impossibility. In the end, then, two of the four points necessary to show that Ezekiel's Rosh is a reference to Russia succeed and two fail. After having considered all of the information, even if Ezekiel understood Rosh to be a proper name, there are far more reasons to see Rosh as pointing to Turkey rather than to Russia. Okay, I'm going to end this video here. In my next video, I will be discussing the religion of Islam in more detail. I will discuss the many attitudes that Muslims have towards the Jewish people and why this makes Islam a perfect Antichrist end times government. So stay tuned for that and thanks very much for watching.